Hello, I'm Pilgrim Beert of Device Pilot, and today I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Karolis Petrushkovicius, Head of Smart Home at Evergreen Energy. Hello, Karolis. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. It's great, great to have you here. So today we're going to talk about heat pumps and how they can best be managed. But maybe we could start with just understanding, you know, your background, how you got into energy uh, and, and what you're doing now. Sure. So uh, my background has been a little bit unconventional to get into heat pumps, uh, the way that I fell in love with them. So I started off uh, as, a, as an economic student, uh, wanting to be an investment banker uh, in the very early stages. Um, I did a couple of internships at uh, one of the investment banks, and then I realized that uh, I actually wanted to be a quant because uh, PhDs in the bank were uh, humble. And uh, I think it was it, it was a great thing that the, the more they knew, the more they knew that they don't know, uh, which is what I really aspired to. So uh, I decided to do a PhD. And uh, one of the PhDs that, one of the areas that was really interesting in investment bank was uh, energy markets. So uh, the movement of energy, uh, how is it made, uh, what actually influences the prices of electricity, gas, uh, and the likes. So this is where I started my journey in uh, in a PhD. So I was doing a PhD in power networks, uh, looking at predicting the wholesale electricity prices in the UK with the increased uptake of heat pumps and uh, renewable energy generation, uh, seeing how how we could better manage these devices uh, to alleviate stress on the grid. So to make sure that they're not all running at the exact same time and smoothing out the demand and making sure that we can utilize as much of that green energy as possible. Um, and uh, th throughout my PhD, I was looking a lot at heat pumps and uh, their control. And there has been a lot of research been done in that area. And uh, it was very interesting. Uh, there weren't that many products out there that could, for example, uh, utilize heat pumps during the times when the electricity is cheapest or produced from renewable sources. And I felt like that was a very important step to making heat pumps more widespread. So the benefits that a, the carbon benefits is, are obvious when you're talking about heat pumps. Um, but from the customer's perspective, it was still quite expensive to run these. Um, not though when you start considering prices and electricity prices that are changing throughout the day and when you can actually shift the consumption of these heat pumps to the periods when the electricity price is cheaper or when it's produced uh, locally from renewable sources. Um, so that was uh, that was very interesting for me and that's how uh, I started uh, Homely Energy uh, at the time. So we, uh, Homely Energy, my first, first heat pump that I ever controlled was my parents' heat pump. Um, it was, I was trying to sh see whether the the algorithms that uh, uh, the algorithm that the algorithms that were proposed uh, by my supervisors were they actually explaining the behavior of the heat pump correctly, um, and uh, the only way to do that was just to try and see how it actually runs and mm. uh, monitor some data. So, mm. uh, started off uh, with that uh, felt like parents can't be too unhappy if I do something to it, uh, so. I uh, played, played around with that um, and uh, realized that there's an opportunity there. And uh, at the time, there were tariffs that were changing throughout, uh, throughout the day, like the octopus agile that were coming out. So we started off with Homely actually allowing heat pumps to be integrated with those tariffs um, and uh, started Homely in that way. Um, realized we needed to do quite a few things. So uh, we had to manufacture our own hardware. Uh, we had to write our own firmware. Uh, firmware for the hardware, we had to do our own app uh, and algorithms, that was my background before. So um, build those things uh, then got acquired by Evergreen Energy in 2020, because uh, we, we were doing similar things and uh, it was a very good connection. So Evergreen Energy uh, have quite a few bits of the business. Uh, one is the easy MCS, uh, which uh, helps MCS installers uh, then we have our own installation business which helps us uh, get that uh, feedback from the customers firsthand and also the installers who are a, a very big important piece of this puzzle so we mm -hmm. want to understand how to make homely easy to install as well as uh, for the end customer they understand how home how heat pump is going to work and at the same time delivering them the best in class uh, efficiencies and uh, 
cost. Then there is, it, this is where Homely kind of came in to make sure that the heat pumps that we're installing, they're installed with Homely and then can deliver these benefits to the end customer. And um, we also had, a, a, we also have a part of the company, which is the virtual power plant. So uh, this is all the kind of exciting stuff that I was uh, looking into throughout my PhD, where when you, when we have a lot more heat pumps out there being deployed um, to make sure that they're um, they're optimized for the benefit of the consumer and the grid as well. Um, you need to start uh, connecting these devices and uh, play them together and potentially even reducing the costs of the customers even further because yeah. you can share some of these benefits of alleviating yeah. the stress of the grid. Great. Oh, well, thank you. That's a lovely story of going from very theoretical analysis to really rolling up your sleeves and doing sort of co-creation with your early users, starting, as you say, with your parents. Um, so, yeah, let's dive into some of those topics you just raised then. Um, I suppose the first one would be if we just think locally just about what's going on in the home, in an individual home. I've heard various stories about people installing heat pumps into legacy heating systems, which have, you know, switch on, switch off thermostats. Um, and and it almost sounds like the heat pumps kind of trying to guess what people actually want with this incredibly crude uh, thermostat kind of in the, almost getting in the way of things. Um, I mean, how well how well are heat pumps managed uh, locally in the home at the moment uh, what do you think the opportunities are for adding more more smarts to to how that job of managing the heat pump in the home is done so uh, this is where homely uh, kind of really as a thermostat um, we realized very early on that uh, the thermostats the on and off thermostats um, are not enough to control heat pumps and um, there are different ways of how heat pumps can be controlled and uh, in a lot of cases the most efficient way that there was at the time was to just use um, heat pump controls as they come with a heat pump mm -hmm. that's not necessarily feasible uh, in a lot of cases because you might need to in a retrofit situation you might need to put the cables uh, through the walls into the main living space uh the uh, whether the customer is happy with the onboard controls of the heat pump is is another question, um, and uh, this is where Homely kind of came to its own. So, in if you're controlling a heat pump with the on, an on and off thermostat, you're not going to achieve the efficiencies that the heat pump uh, has claimed to achieve. So, uh, those COPs of let's say four units of heat for every electricity unit that you put in. Um, that is not going to happen because you're not uh, operating the heat pump in the way that it's been designed. Mm -hmm. um, and with heat pumps, this is, it comes down to uh, that you're trying to lower the flow temperatures of the heat pump. So you're trying to keep to keep them as low as possible um, to increase the efficiencies. As an example, um, one of the heat pumps said uh, that one of the heat pumps that I have just in my mind at the moment is uh, at 10 degrees outside, an air source heat pump, if you were to raise your flow temperature to 55 degrees, the efficiency would be three, the COP would be three to one. So three units of heat for every electricity unit that you put in. But if you were to keep those flow temperatures at 35 degrees, the efficiencies would be five units of heat for every electricity unit that you put in. So even though um, with a heat pump, you heat the house for longer, so the heat pump is running for example, all constantly in the background throughout the day, maintaining the same temperature throughout the day, it's running at much lower flow temperatures, uh, which means that the efficiencies increase and the actual consumption of energy and carbon emissions uh, are minimized mm -hmm. rather than just run doing these short, big bursts of energy uh, like you would have done with a gas boiler and you would have been used to do with a gas boiler with an on-off thermostats. Um, so this is where that thinking about the control needs to uh, needs to be changed when we're talking about heat pumps. They either need to be installed with manufacturer controls, uh, if that is suitable, uh, where they have the they have the capabilities that uh, the heat pump can basically maximize its efficiency, um, or in a lot of cases, home we can actually do that and uh, quite a bit more. So integrations with electricity tariffs, uh, integrations with PV, battery, um, all of that kind of is the additional layer of benefits that Homely can bring to heat pump users. Okay. So so if we if we just think then really just still at the sort of local individual home level, I mean, you're saying COPs of five or three or, or whatever. So, I mean, it sounds as though there's tens of percent of, of efficiency gains potentially from, from managing heat pumps 
in a smart way, even even just locally? I mean, is that I mean, would you care to put a rough number on what you think the gains can be between perhaps the very worst case where it's got a an on off thermostat versus, um, you know, doing, uh, you know, the best continuous job of, of keeping the, the flow temperatures as low as possible? Any rough, in many, rough idea? Yes. In many cases, uh, what we've seen is that uh, heat pumps are set up on uh, what's called a default weather compensation curve. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is uh, this is not the weather compensation that would be a specific for that house, um, but it's just been set up so that it could work with the third party thermostat. And at the same time, it would have some sort of uh, some level of the weather compensation. So it's kind of trying to match mesh up the two and not really doing either of them really well. Mm -hmm. It does improve the efficiency of the heat pump, which is uh, great. It's just not doing it as much as a very well done weather compensation would do, uh, which is where Homely comes in. So uh, what we've seen is that if we're comparing, I think comparing it to the worst case scenario, um, it's a little bit unfair saying that it, it, we don't know that many people that are setting up heat pumps, for example, at if they operate just uh, at the lowest, at the highest low temperatures possible. Uh, but if we're comparing to the default weather compensation, uh, we're seeing from our own data, we, we're seeing that the savings can be above 50%. Um, that is purely from just uh, optimizing the heat pump operation. So doing that um, auto adapting weather compensation for the customers. And that's 15% on the energy use, mm. above 50% of the energy use and also um, costs. Wow. That's really worth having. Um, great. So uh, that's that's thinking at a local level. So now if we start to kind of bring in the bigger picture and think about what the what the grid needs and renewable generation needs and, and so on, uh, you mentioned at the beginning thinking a little bit about uh, shifting tariff optimization, all that sort of stuff. I mean, is that really possible? Um, I suppose I think, you know, one issue is that people can behave quite synchronously sometimes. I mean, obviously, there are different types of people, people who are in their houses during the day and people who aren't and things like that. So there's, you know, perhaps an opportunity to to trade off between them. But um, but generally, a lot of the population kind of behave in a similar way. They come back at home at the same sort of time and they expect their home to be comfortable at the same sorts of times. Um, I mean, is there is there really an opportunity? And, and also, presumably, if you're going to shift things, you need you need some storage somewhere in the in the fabric of the house or, or elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe you could just sort of discuss that whole topic, you know, the opportunities for for shifting um, electricity consumption with with heat pumps and optimizing against tariffs and so on. And again, if you can if you can quantify it as much as possible, that'd be really interesting. So in terms of shifting the loads around, uh, the to answer the first question, is there an opportunity? Um, the opportunity is huge. Um, so uh, where heat pumps are, have been installed and from the data that we've seen, um, there is quite a lot of it, shifting potential in these homes. So once you turn off your heating, even in the colder months of the year, the temperature only drops by around a, a degree uh, in these homes. So it just again, depends on how well insulated the house is, but uh, just from the data, we're seeing that in a lot of cases where heat pumps have been installed, it is in the in that region where you can actually uh, turn off your heat pump and you can, in the coldest months of the year, and uh, your temperature is only going to drop by a degree. Uh, by a degree in, much, is that in an hour? or uh, By a degree in an hour, this is in yeah. the coldest months. Yeah. Uh, and then in the warmer months, you could be, two three hours to uh, to drop mm -hmm. by a degree mm -hmm. uh, which is great uh, which means that you can actually just uh, put a little bit more heat into this house for the, during those cheaper periods um, less congested periods and then jump through the periods where it's more expensive um quantifying the benefit of this uh, so we've seen uh, we've done our own analysis but i feel like the the customers uh, that have posted for example on our twitter account um those ev that evidence is a little bit stronger for, for the listeners of the podcast, maybe. So uh, if you look in our, on our Twitter, um, when the electricity markets were not as crazy as they are right now, um, customers that were using Homely on an Agile tariff were saving somewhere around 30% on their heating bills. Wow. And those are uh, their own analysis is, uh, was shared on our Twitter channel. So you can have a look at that. And uh, it is it, it, the way that it, in Homely's 
situation that works is that uh, you as a customer, you go on to this uh, smart plus mode, which is the optimization using all the things about the heat pump. So understanding that COPs are different at different flow temperatures, at different outside temperatures, uh, understanding what the solar gains are doing to your house so that you're not overheating the house too much. And then at the same time, looking at the electricity prices. Um, taking all of this into account and basically coming up with this optimal schedule of heating throughout the day. So in my scenario, I am on intelligent octopus tariff. Mm -hmm. I, ha I still have the 5p electricity overnight and then the, I think it's around 24p throughout the day. My heat pump does most of my heating. So I have set points of 20 degrees uh, throughout the day and I've set my flexibility to be uh, 2 degrees. So I'm, I'm comfortable with a temperature anywhere between 20 and 22 degrees throughout the day. Um, and this is where this allows basically Homely to do the control within the constraints that the customer has provided. Mm -hmm. so the customer is always in the driver's seat. Um, he's telling, he's just giving us the flexibility that I don't mind if you are working within these boundaries. Um, and my Homely in the background, what it's doing is that it's doing all the hot water preheating during the cheapest time. So I'm using majority of my hot water consumption actually happens to, with 5p electricity that, that is overnight mm -hmm. and then uh, my heating also overheats the house uh, just enough so that it gets me through majority of the day and then when it get, once it gets back to temperature it goes into the weather compensation um, in addition to that in some cases uh, also accounting for the fact that I might not need to jump through the rest of the day because sun is going to be coming out so it might start heating my house uh, through the windows and I just need to dump enough heat so that it gets me to the period when the sun comes out and that is going to get through the rest of the day. Again, saving yeah. energy, making sure that we're not overheating the house during the cheaper periods. So Homely is able to learn, I mean, things like um, insulation, you know, solar heating of your house uh, through the windows, that it's able to learn over time. Uh, it presumably knows what the weather's like outside your house from the weather forecast. And then um, it, it can kind of correlate. OK, well, when it's sunny at three o'clock, there seems to be the house seems to heat up quite quite well. And it sort of learns that over time, does it? Yes. So the first couple of weeks, uh, there might it, it might not be as optimal as it could be. Um, but after that, uh, we look at the historical data for the house. We look at how much heat has been emitted into the house at different times. We look at what the sol historical solar uh, was doing. Mm -hmm. And from all of that information, we construct uh, this kind of image of this house, how long it takes for it to heat up, how long it takes for it to cool down, and um, how much heat does it actually take to raise this temperature in the house by a certain amount of degrees? What is, we even learn the direction of the house. So by looking at mm. the data, we're uh, actually learning what is the direction of the room where the temperature sensor is based. And from that, we can, when we're doing the predictions and optimization, we're saying that, okay, these are the weather forecasts. These are the electricity prices for the next day. These are the PV predictions, PV radiance predictions. Um, what is the most optimal way to achieve these temperatures um, for this customer using all this information, understanding that it is a heat pump. So you, um, in an agile scenario, for example, you raising the flow temperatures um, too high might mean quite big, as we've spoken before, it might mean quite big penalties on the efficiency of the heat pump. Mm -hmm. So if the price differential between two different periods is small, then does it really make sense for you to kind of go full blast during the cheaper periods? Um, because at that point, you're going to be raising the flow temperatures, which will mean that your efficiencies are going mm -hmm. to drop for the heat pump. And Homely would take all of that into account. Yeah, uh, fascinating. If, and then presumably if you're so looking at it from outside the house, from the grid's perspective, you then have a fleet of uh, houses, some of which you now know are east facing and some are west facing or or whatever. And so you can start to build strategies for how to manage grid load locally and, and nationally, um, you know, predicting what's going to happen to those houses with the weather forecast and so on. Um, yes. And that's going to be uh, so this is the next step. Uh, we've already seen um, schemes like the demand flexibility service and um, that is becoming uh, more and more interesting for this winter from the national grid's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we would never do this uh, without the consent of the customer, but if the customers are happy to provide the service to the grid, kind of protect it and uh, to also share some of the benefits that we're going to make uh, from managing these heat pumps, um, 
we are planning on actually uh, providing the service uh, this winter to be the one of the will be to, to, to provide the flexibility for the grid from heat pumps um, out there. Fascinating. Yeah. Customers can opt in, receive payments for when they actually manage the loads and without the without the impact on their comfort as well. So in this scenario, what we'd see and from my PhD as well, um, the bit that I was looking in the most is how can these, how can you achieve this uh, whole grid uh Kind of how can you make sure that the power is produced uh, during the times when you want to consume it the most? How do you make sure that you're consuming as much of that power from renewable generation? And what is that uh, best scenario for the grid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Um, so if we think then about pricing, you mentioned the Octopus Agile tariff and, and Intelligent Octopus, which are sort of time of use and possibly flexible uh, dynamic tariffs which change half, half hourly. Um, you know, one might assume that pricing signals are a, a, a sensible way for all these moving parts to um, talk to each other and decide what they're going to do. I mean, they can't there can't be one controller that controls everything everywhere. So there has to be some sort of medium of exchange, and and, and price would seem to be the obvious one. Um, so, can we just talk a bit about pricing signals? Um, I suppose I'm sort of interested in how. You know how real time are they? How how far ahead do you need to know them to pl to plan ahead? You know how quickly can they change? And the weather forecast isn't always right. Um, you, you know, can you just talk a little bit about pricing signals? I mean, do you think that's that's really becoming a thing? From my perspective and from my PhD perspective, I think the price signals are really good in uh, kind of influencing the behavior of devices. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily know for sure whether that needs to be. Uh, the same thing as gets put to the end customer. So I think um, I think those customers that are very happy to take the risk of, for example, being on Agile tariff and expect these sudden price changes, for example, when there is this light change in the in the weather, um, is great for those customers, but it's not for everyone. And I think here uh, the concepts remain the same. That behind the scenes there should be something influencing these devices to shift their loads into off these periods into the periods of high generation of renewables um but what's actually being communicated uh, to the end customer needs to be it can be actually amended so you could for example have tariffs where the end customer receives a rebate at the end of the month uh, if we've managed to shift their loads around and we managed to save money so you're sharing some of this benefit uh, mm. in in the background is still working on the price signals of wholesale Sure. Um, you know, I was interested. Uh, I think the the Tesla Octopus uh, tariff in the UK. My, if my understanding of it is that you you basically get a guaranteed flat tariff of like ten pence a unit or something, and then all the management's done for you. So you're just sort of given a a guarantee of low prices, and uh, you're not exposed to the risk or the upside. <laughs> but you're you're given a nice simple proposition which doesn't require you to. Um, you know, get get too involved. Uh, so I can definitely see that working for a lot of people. Um, presumably, when you're when you're modeling this, uh, which is how you started in your PhD, it must be quite hard to model because there's a lot of feedback, isn't there? There's sort of a lot of loops in the model. So you've got the behaviors of machines and people responding to pricing, and that will in, in itself then affect the pricing, particularly in a short loop. You know, if there's a sudden unexpected cold snap or or even some social event where suddenly everybody decides to go into their house or outside of their house or do, do whatever, that, that could then feed back into pricing, which could then cause things to behave. I mean, it's, it sounds as though it could be really quite hard to model all that stuff. And, and um, you know, the model might reach equilibrium or, or not. It might go, you know, are there, are there pathological cases where the model kind of goes out of control and price becomes insanely high? You know, we've seen amazingly uh, in places like Texas, um, the uh, you know the price signals have gone completely out of control when the when the grids run into trouble. Um, you know, is it? Uh, sorry, I'm aware I'm asking a question that doesn't have a definitive answer, but I mean, do you, is it really possible to model all that stuff sort of well enough? It's tough. Uh, I reached some of these uh, some of these issues whilst I was doing uh, my PhD. Um, I had to put put in fictional uh, dampeners in the modeling mm. to make mm. sure that the price signals are not uh, as, as are not as strong as mm. you said. Uh, past a certain point, people start 
if you have enough people that are doing the exact same thing and if the electricity pricing is half hourly, uh, as an example, if you have a very cheap electricity, 3.30 and 4, and uh, expensive electricity between 4 and 4.30, everyone is going to start, if they're exposed to these prices, everyone is going to start shifting into 3.30 to 4, and then this price is actually going to reduce, but the other one is going to increase. Mm-hmm. Um, here, the interesting thing about houses, and I think this comes back to your previous question in terms of like how much in advance do you need to know these prices to make decisions? Um, it all depends on how well insulated the house, houses are. Mm. Basically, how long in advance do you need to know that you need to preheat this house mm-hmm. um, so that you can, for example, jump through a specific period? Um, and uh, the other thing is the more insulated the house is, um, the more of a period you're going to have, like, basically you're going to have a bigger flexibility from the house because it's going to be able to uh, maintain that constant temperature, for example, for longer. Mm-hmm. So um, the the question around basically how far in advance do you need to know these events comes back to uh, how long is the event. So if it's only for half an hour, you might be able to just boost up the heating half an hour before and you're mm-hmm. going to be able to jump through through the next half an hour. But if the event is actually a couple of hours, then you need to do a lot more preheating. So public um, public tariffs like um, the Octopus Agile one, I think, are set a day ahead. Is that right? Um, sort of half hourly pricing, but you know what it's going to be for the day ahead, I, I think. Um, is, uh, is wholesale sort of real time uh, pricing actually decided on a half hour by half hour basis? Could the whole system suddenly decide that the price has gone up a lot for the for the half hour ahead of now? So I'm not um, in terms of the trading. Um, it, it's quite complicated. Uh, so there are there are auctions um, that are clearing out at a specific time, and these, uh, for example, what you're seeing as the APX auction clearing is what the prices have been set in that auction. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that those prices are staying the same throughout the day. Mm-hmm. So uh, this was basically the price that uh, the buyers and the sellers agreed in the market to enter into uh, for a specific amount of energy. Um, if you, let's say, if, if your predictions of load uh, were underestimated or overestimated, you're going to need to either buy or sell this power um, after this auction. And at that point, it's a, it's a little bit more... Uh, complicated about how you actually do that so it depends how far in advance you understand this um and i think it would be it would probably need a, a different session to, to actually go through the yeah. complexity of how the, yeah. how the market trading arrangements work okay but it gives you a different lever you can play the financial game but you can also turn things on and off and, and uh so you have those two two levers as it were so s- smart meters sound quite um quite relevant to all this in because presumably well, essential really because they're the only kind of fiscally auditable um cash register kind of in the system to actually um uh you know measure what what actually happened i mean is that a fair statement i completely agree yes yeah. um smart metering is the critical infrastructure that we need to make this available so rather than um settling on profiles of the customer profiles where we don't know what actually happens in each half hour and we can't uh, the, the the buyers of the electricity can't actually say that I need this amount of energy uh, during this this half hour um, mm-hmm. because in the end they're still settled on profiles. Um, you need to have the smart metering infrastructure to be able to have this cash register basically which says that in this half hour, this is how much power you've consumed. Yep. This, yep. Great. Well, maybe we can just wrap up with a final question, which is uh, as somebody who's deeply involved in uh, helping heat pumps deploy across the UK and and be uh, as efficient as possible. If uh, if we made you king tomorrow, Carolus, what um what would you what would you do? What would what law would you pass? Um, uh, you know, what is the biggest challenge? Do you think to actually deploying heat pumps quickly at scale in the UK? And and if uh, yeah, if you were king for a day, what uh, what would you change uh, to to accelerate that? There are quite a few things that we need to change to make sure that we reach the targets that we've set out as a country. Uh, but I think, and again, because I'm, I'm an economist by training, uh, I believe that there are there needs to be incentives for people um, to do this. And I think uh, the big one is uh, the price of electricity and the price of gas. Um, so uh, historically, 
a while back, we've seen that uh, gas has been so much cheaper than electricity, and uh, that made heat pumps, uh, in some cases, not much cheaper to run than mm. gas boilers. Mm. Um, that, that would depend on basically the, the design of the system. So I think, um, and that was that was for a multitude of reasons. Uh, le- green levies that were uh, kind of added on to the electricity prices. Uh, and uh, making inflating the electricity prices too much so i think i think if i was um, making and i could do something about it i just make sure that uh, the electricity price and the gas price are done fairly and uh, i think one once we have a price signal that and at the moment we already have a market where it's cheaper to run a heat pump than a gas boiler mm-hmm. i think we need to potentially do even more than this to kind of keep this traction up where people want to shift onto a heat pump because it's going to save the money. Like it's a, it's a no brainer. You're saving carbon, you're saving cash every month. Um, we do get asked the question, what's the return on investment mm. in the heat pump? Um, if we can make this as attractive as it can be, then what, why would you not? Yeah, I can definitely see analogies there with what's happening with electric vehicles, where in the early days it was people doing it for climate reasons or or because they love technology or, or whatever. But then, you know, gradually everyone started to realize actually it's cheaper. It's just cheaper to have an EV um, than, than an internal combustion engine car. And so uh, you, you then start to see all sorts of people in business and others just making a simple financial uh, decision, which is, uh, you know, what seems to really push it into the mainstream. Well, you know, thank you everyone for watching today. And thank you, Carolis, for so generously sharing all your knowledge with us. Thank you very much for having me.